Part 2. Chapter 9. The Morbific and Sanative Influence of Though. Mind is the only active power in the universe, and to most people its influence is unintelligible and incomprehensible. It is only because it acts unseen and unobserved that it has come to be undervalued. Its power is hidden from the view of the senses, but the most potent forces of nature act silently and with no noise or show. The kingdom of the heavens cometh not with observation or under the cognizance of the senses. Mind is the only causal agent in the realm of matter and certainly in the human body. A simple thought, which is a mental act or state, has a marvelous power over the body. It may in its influence be morbific, or that which generates disease, or it may be sanative and promotive of health. In many diseases, especially those of a so-called nervous character, there is too much thinking, or rather too much thought in one direction and in a wrong direction. This state of thinking and feeling is the cause of the bodily condition. As the body is the creation of the mind, and is always its ultimation or outward expression, a chronic disease is the fixedness of a thought, the petrifaction of a morbid idea. Thoughts or ideas are the most real things in the universe. They are the interior soul of things, and the underlying reality of all outward and visible objects. The things we behold in the natural world are the thoughts of God, and by studying them we come into communication with His thoughts, as we do with the ideas of an author by reading the words of his book. The mind is the real man and its thoughts act on the body as a spiritual poison, or as a mental medicine. For health and disease, in their spiritual essence, may be resolved into modes of thinking. A man is well so long as he thinks, feels, and believes himself so. For to be sick and not know it is all the same as not to be sick. And for a physician to tell a patient that he has a disease is oftentimes to create it. And to assure him that he has it not, except in his own thought, and cause him to believe it, is a short and easy method of curing him. What is all this but a change of thought? It is the substitution of one way of thinking for another. Let us look for a moment at the power of thought. Whatever a man consciously makes or invents is always first a thought, an idea, before it is shaped into an objective or external thing. The house in which we live, or the ship in which we sail, first exists as a spiritual reality in the mind of the architect and builder. The picture in the soul of the painter and the statue in the idea of the sculptor. This was the doctrine of Plato four centuries before Christ. Everything exists in idea before it can have an external and material realization. A visible thing, whether it be a granite boulder or a physical disease, is the outness of a thought, the externalization of an idea. And an idea is the inward existence, the spiritual reality, of a sensible object. But there are false ideas and true ones, a right and a wrong way of thinking. A false or fallacious idea is ultimate or externally manifested in the body by disease, and then truth is the best medicine. Thought is a creative power, and it always forms something in its own image, a likeness and correspondence of itself. A bad thought, a false and fallacious idea, a wrong conception and belief ultimate themselves in the body and disease. Acute, if it be a temporary mental state and chronic, if it be a confirmed mode of thinking. Pre-existent ideas and feelings are the patterns after which the body shapes itself by a necessary law of spiritual cause and material effect. The sincerity and deepness of our belief, or recognition of those ideas as realities, is always the measure of the extent and permanency of their effects upon the body. The condition of the body is only the interior becoming the outward, and the excellence or defect of the idea is the body's health or malady. The disease is preceded by an a priori wrong way of thinking, and the cure is the result, in every case, of an antecedent change of thought and idea. This is the philosophy of the system of cure practiced by Jesus the Christ, and forever consecrated by him as the divine method of healing both soul and body. Everything resolves itself back into an idea. The solid framework of the world, with all its objects of beauty and use, are but the crystallization of God's thoughts. Fulton's idea became solidified into a steamboat, Stevenson's into a railroad, and Morse's into a telegraph. A factory is only somebody's thought condensed into a material manifestation. And any fall try way of thinking, any defect in the original idea, makes the machinery go wrong and causes an imperfect manufacture. There is the whole spiritual theory of disease. 
For what is true of a mill is more certainly true of the body and its relation to the mind. Men have only begun to realize the power of thought over the external organism, the influence of ideas, of imagination, of faith, and feeling over the corporeal condition and the physiological functions. This is, as I have just said, the divine method of cure, because the relation of soul and body is analogous to that which God sustains to the visible world. Jesus the Christ, who exhibited the highest type of humanity and was, consequently, the divinest manifestation of God, found the remedy for disease and truth. He came to make known the truth and thereby save the lost or those who, in their bewilderment, had wandered away from it. Truth is that which is. Error, which is the soul of disease, is that which is not. The one is the reality of things, the other has no being. If, then, we supplant in the mind of another an error by substituting for it a positive truth, we put something where before there was in reality nothing. Disease is often but an error, a fallacious idea, a falsity, a wrong way of thinking, and, consequently, in itself a nihility or nothingness. In all those cases the best remedy and the only specific is the opposite truth. Hero the spiritual teacher and the physician meet and become one. Of this we have the highest illustration in the life and work of Jesus the Christ. Every thought which has truth for its foundation, or has its root in the one and only reality, has in it the life of God. Just as a particle of water proceeding from the ocean by emanation or evaporation is a miniature sea, a microscopic ocean, and has all the properties of the Atlantic whence it came. Hence, a thought, a truth, whose inward essence is always divine, has in it the very life of God, and must have the highest therapeutic virtue of anything in the universe. The mind is the only life of the body, and the only real and enduring thing in human nature. No one ever dies of what is called disease, as has been said in a previous chapter. It is only when faith, hope, and imagination lose their hold upon the organic structure, and the soul relaxes its grasp upon the body, that it yields. Then it goes down like a scuttled ship in a storm. It is only kept afloat by the buoyancy that the mind imparts to it, and when the connection between it and its life preserver is sundered, it goes under the waves to rise no more. When the correspondence between the mind and body ceases, the body dies as a lamp expires when the oil is exhausted. Thought is the grand characteristic of man and belongs to the essence of the soul. The word man, according to Max Muller, is an ancient Sanskrit word meaning to think and is the root of the Zend word mantra, speech. Man may be defined as the being who thinks and speaks. This separates him by a wide chasm from all the orders of animals below him. A change of thought, or of a fixed mode of thinking, must of necessity modify the state of the soul, as the very existence of the soul is identical with thought, and it creates the body into its own image and likeness. It is easy from this to see how much it must have to do with health and disease. If love is the life of man, as Swedenborg affirms, thought is the existence, or outward manifestation, of that vital element or principle and the quality of that existence must depend upon the character of his thoughts. The mind always thinks, and must as long as it lives. It was the opinion of Kant, expressed in his anthropology, that we always think when we sleep, that to cease to dream would be an extinction of our life. He also says that we can dream more in a minute than we can act in a day, and that the great rapidity of the train of thought in sleep is one of the principal causes why we do not always recollect what we dream he elsewhere observes that the cessation of a force to act is tantamount to its cessation to be. With the above view, Sir William Hamilton agrees. Long before Kant, Cicero, the Roman philosopher and orator, affirmed that the mind is always active. He says, the soul can never be destitute of thought and activity. Being, or life, comes to its first active manifestation in thought. In the beginning, in the first principle or pure being, as the original term means, was the word or thought of God. By this all things were and are created. Zo in man, who is the image of God, thought is the first manifestation of the living principle in him, or that by which being goes forth into existence and into a bodily expression. When we say that a man's thoughts are employed on business, or trade, or government, or art, or philanthropy, we mean the current of his life tends to that form of activity. It is set or fixed, which is the radical meaning of the word think, 
in that particular direction. The same is true of disease, its inmost essence being a fixity of thought in a false position. Especially is this true when the morbid condition becomes chronic. Our life always flows out into manifestation in the direction of our thoughts, and disease is only a state, or, as the word etymologically signifies, a standing still of thought, in other words, an immovable fixedness of a morbid way of thinking. But as our varying modes of thought are, to a certain extent, under the control of the self-determining power of the will, so to the same extent health and disease are under the dominion of the mind, or the voluntary exercise of faith and imagination. If there is any power resident in human nature which possess a creative energy and a modifying influence over the bodily condition, and one that lies within the compass of the God-given abilities of the soul, so to exercise as to change the morbid mode of thinking, that is, the spiritual essence of disease, let us search earnestly among our faculties to find it. The practical value of the discovery will he a full reward for any sincere effort that may be expended in the quest.